the Spirit of God hovered over the waters at the moment of creation. Like the universe exploding outward from the single spark of God's Word, so the church became real. Put your hand on the ground. The earth itself is vibrating. The mountains, the oceans, the deserts, the creatures that live here are all breathing in. The planet is inhaling. Imagine the song it will sing, the song of Pentecost. Joy enveloped the disciples. Their words were understood and welcomed. Their joy was contagious. Their message was heard and translated and shared. The church moved into the world, bringing light, bringing love, covering all there was. There was no denying it. There was no going back. The church as we know it was born. God, we feel your presence. Let us use it. Let us take this rush, this moment, this Pentecost, shouting into a world that is bored stiff by life. We have been made aware of the presence of the creator of the universe. Give us the strength to keep it going. God is real. The church is born. The song goes on and everyone can sing. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Reverend Jim Oman. I'm one of the pastors here at Kingsway. And so on behalf of our staff and all of us who uh, participate in church here and lead our church, we want to welcome you today, whether you're online or you're here in person. This is Pentecost Sunday. This is a day that the church uh, sets aside as the birth of the church. It's when God reached into this world to give those early disciples a sense that indeed God was in control. So today, as we come to worship together, as we come to sing and listen to our choir and hear the word proclaimed by Pastor Scott, I want to invite you to be thinking about how God, through the Holy Spirit, is talking to you today. Some people say maybe that Pentecost is an old holiday. Well, I say it's a relevant holiday for anyone, anywhere. All around the world today, people are celebrating this day. So what, in what way is God calling you today? So I want to welcome you and encourage you to fill out those Connect cards. You can put them in the offering plate later, or you can drop them in a basket. That way we can receive information, especially prayer requests. If you have something that you need to be prayed for or prayed over, both our pastors, our staff, as well as our prayer team pray for all those prayer requests. So please take time to fill that out today. Any other changes you might have in terms of your address or your phone number, or your email, would be really helpful too. So we appreciate you giving all that to us. I just have a, a couple of quick announcements today on Pentecost Sunday. The first is that we have coming up next Saturday the United Methodist Men Breakfast, which I know they haven't done for quite a while. And so I'm excited about it. I'm going to be a part of it this week and sharing a little bit about the United Methodist Church and where we are in all of our various understandings of the church. So I'll be there. I invite you to come in and have a breakfast and enjoy a fellowship. I know we're looking forward to getting that going again. Also, we have coming up our summer jam activities, which are the things that we have built. I'm really excited about this for our children. Uh, you know, as you know, we ended up not having the outside summer camp, so we built a whole series of things in the summer for children. Not just a VBS kind of a camp, but other Wednesday night activities. So please check that out. It's on our website. It's always, we're lifting it up, and it's starting up soon. Also, we have coming up the United Methodist Night at the Springfield Cardinals. And if you've ever been to one of these, it's pretty cool to see all these United Methodists come from all over the Ozarks to be a part of the ball game that night. We get recognized, and I encourage you to come. It's a great time. It's, it's very affordable. So if you're interested, you need to see Zoe Russell, our hospitality director, or you can call the church office during the week. And the last announcement I have really is that we always have children's discipleship running at both of our worship services. So if, if you ever uh, have a grandchild or a child as you come to this service that needs to go, please know you can go anytime and participate in those children's activities in our children's wing. 
So now as we begin on Pentecost Sunday to worship, I invite you to stand and join with myself in our call to worship today. How are you doing this morning? It would be easy for us to say, fine, thank you. But the truth is that there are lots of things going on in your lives, lots of time crunches and pressures. You have come to the right place. Rest for a minute. Take a deep breath and let it out slowly. Just relax and let your heart be open to God's word for you. That sounds good to us. Feel the healing, the soothing power of God's love for you. Lord, we rest our minds, spirits, and hearts in your compassionate love. Amen. I invite you to take a moment and greet those around you. Spread God's peace this morning as we prepare for worship. As you are able, I invite you this morning to remain standing and join in singing our opening hymn, I Sing the Almighty Power of God, number 152. Sing the Almighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to Pentecost Sunday, as we come to our time of prayer, I know that uh, we bring a lot of burdens and worries, and how in the world can you not be worried about a world right now? No matter what we see around us, though, when we come into this sanctuary, in this holy place, praying for God's presence to be poured upon us, the Holy Spirit, that we mark today as the beginning of the church, we pray today that that same Holy Spirit can touch us. So I invite you now as to come into this time of prayer, no matter what kind of burdens you're carrying, worries, concerns, maybe confessions, maybe things that are on your heart today, and know that God can heal all of the things we bring before him, but we need to be open with God. And so this is the time that we open up to God. As we pray today, I want to lift up our senior high mission trip. Our young people are leaving uh, about right now to head on their mission trip to go to Memphis to do some mission work. We have how many, Scott? 14? 14 youth and five adults that are 
four adults heading off to Memphis. So let's pray for them today. Pray for their safety, for their travel. And let's pray that they have a, a Pentecost kind of an experience this week where God touches them somehow. So I invite you now to, to join me in prayer, to bow your heads, be open to the Holy Spirit as we listen to what God has to say to us today. Let's pray. Holy God, we come before you in awe of your incredible creation. All around us we see signs of your love and your presence, your creativity. All around us we understand that you have reached into this world and made it a better place. But we confess that in the midst of the struggles that we see around us, we often doubt your presence. We know throughout history, Lord, you reached into your world, into your creation to give us signs of your presence, that gift of the Holy Spirit. So today as we pray, as we hear your word, as we remember those around us who are in need of prayer, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us today. Help us to understand that we are still your instruments of love and hope in this world. I pray, Lord God, that every single person here today will find something that they can take with them today that will help them become stronger in their faith and more committed in love. So we offer our prayers to you today, those that we have spoken, as well as those that are on our hearts. And we lift them up to you now. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning, folks, as the choir prepares to sing, uh, I invite you on this day of Pentecost uh, to to. Uh, Prepare to be a part of giving to the church uh, and ask that you prepare your tithes and your offerings as the plates come forward this morning uh, and enjoy the choir's anthem.
Good morning. So good to see each and every one of you and knowing many more of you are joining us online at home. My name is Pastor Scott Bonds, another one of the pastors here at Kingsway and just so glad that you are here. As we get started this morning, if you have your Bibles in any format on your phone or a physical copy, go ahead and open them to John 15. There are pew Bibles in front of you. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12 today. And we're going to do that to start out our service. If you don't have Bibles this morning, no worries. It will be on the screen behind me or on screen online. Again, John 15, we're going to look at verses 1 through 12. Here we go. Jesus speaking says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing." If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my word abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. For the gift of Scripture. Today is week three of four of our Faith Goes to Work series here at Kingsway. In each of these four parts of this series, you're going to hear from four different voices so that we, and what we can learn about work and rest. If you heard what Pastor Karen said, the first two weeks probably leaned pretty heavily on the work side of things, and I guess that leaves Pastor Jim and myself to talk about rest. Now, if you're at home and you haven't seen these last couple of weeks, no worries. Go ahead and like, just stop and pause and go ahead and watch those other two weeks before picking this one up. Do not walk out of the sanctuary, friends that are in here. You're just going to have to go back later and watch those, right, if you have missed those first two parts. Well, I'm going to lean pr- pretty heavily into the rest side of things of this conversation. Let me just say one quick thing about work before we get, as we get started, especially when we think about living and operating in the Christian circles, right? Having worked with students for a, first, uh, for a lot of my career, the question inevitably comes, what is God calling me to do, right? What is God calling me to do? We have those conversations with students all the time, and I love these conversations, What I don't love is that somehow is people end up with the idea that if you want to be a Christian and you want to be a very serious Christian, like you're going to really live into what it means to be a Christian, then you must either be a pastor or a missionary, right? If you're going to be a really serious Christian, those are your two options. If not, there's just second tier kind of Christians. Uh, I don't know how we get that idea, but it seems like a lot of people get it. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. God does call these people, but he also calls us to be teachers and doctors and lawyers and engineers and police officers and janitors and so many more things in this world, right? God calls us to do lots of things. And here's what I've convinced of, and here's what I tell students all the time, and I want you to hear this, and I want you to remember, because this is going to come back up here in a few minutes, is this. I don't think God is as concerned with what we do as with how we do it. Let me say that again. I don't think God is as concerned with what we do, what our jobs are, as he is with how we do our jobs. Does that make sense? Everybody say amen if you make sense. In a lot of situations, God cares more about how you do what you do than what you specifically do. He just calls us to do everything as a follower of Jesus and in ways that honor and glorify him. 
So he tells us to be the best teacher and the best doctor and the best lawyer and the best engineer and the best police officer and be the best janitor you can be and use it to honor and glorify God and to serve your neighbors. Our faith and following of Jesus ought to seep into every aspect of our lives, including our work. God's not so concerned about what we do as how we do it. Now, with that in mind, here we go talking about rest this morning. When I think about work and rest in our culture, what oftentimes comes to mind is this sentiment. Hear it all the time. I cannot wait to get to Friday so I can enjoy the weekend, right? Many of you finished that in your head. I feel like I saw some mouths moving. I know some of you already knew what I was going to say before I said it. Things like, I've worked hard all week, so now I can play hard and just enjoy this weekend. I've just got to get through this work week so I can get to Friday and I can get to Saturday, you know. Uh, We can get to 5 o'clock on Friday, whatever it is. Come Sunday, here's another week to just get out of the way so that I can get to the next weekend. This vicious cycle of work and weekend. And this is such a prevalent culture that are a thing in our culture that there are songs, literal songs, written and filled with this idea. Just got to get to Friday, just got to get to the weekend. Just got to get this work week over so I can work or so I can play and I can rest. I mean, that's kind of what we just did this last weekend, right? Memorial Day weekend. We work so hard so we can get to the long weekend and fill it with golf and traveling and time at the lake and grilling and barbecuing. And yes, there is a difference if you don't know that. Um, And as I've told my family, the students and my students' families uh, for so long that you could just get to the point where you can do the things you love with the people you love this last weekend, Memorial Day weekend. You just got to get through the work week. And got to get through the grind and all that that represents. Now, some of you are already dreading going back to work tomorrow, aren't you? You're like, oh, if I could just have one more, one more day, one more, a little longer weekend. Those of you that are retired are like, I don't have that problem. But in living our lives this way, friends, the question becomes how are we doing? How are we doing? Like, how are we really doing? Like, really, really doing? Statistics say we're not doing great. We're not doing great. Our work cultural landscape right now, if you don't know, is pretty dark. Those of you that own businesses and have employees, you understand this. Here's some statistics for you. Last year, you maybe heard about the language of the great resignation and people fleeing their jobs in record numbers. Many people have left the workforce for an undetermined amount of time, and who knows when and if they'll be back. As we learned this spring, as Pastor Jim said, with our camp plans this year, we're still dealing with the fallout of that. Businesses are still hiring and struggling, trying to find employees. In case you missed it, according to one survey, 65% of people are still considering switching jobs leaving their jobs and their careers. Of those, 56% of them just want a better work-life balance. 25% of people are at least somewhat dissatisfied with their current jobs. 30% of people just say their job is something they have to do to get by. That's not very encouraging, is it? That makes every day pretty difficult. Yet at a lot of the times, we're still leaving a lot of meat on the bones. When it comes to to taking rest and taking time off, Americans fail to use 768 million days of PTO, paid time off a year. Let me say that again, and it's rising. 768 million days of PTO a year in America. That is 6.144 billion hours of work time off not taken and rising every year. 55% of people don't use all of their time off, and when they do take their time off, 52% of them say they end up working on their days off. When we do inevitably take a day off, especially when we're sick, one in five people have misled their manager or their supervisor about their sick, sick, or why they're taking their sick time. 25% of them said they just took it to sleep, and 50% of them said they just needed a mental health day. 
One HR manager put it this way, the stress, guilt, and shame people feel around time off is very real, so they typically suck it up and try to power through. Sound familiar? You ever been there at anywhere in your career? But the problem is, as we see, it's just not working. Doing all these things isn't working. A Fortune five, uh, the Fortune magazine article captures it well. It says, the great resignation is sparking fears of a great burnout that could cripple America's workforce. The great resignation is sparking fears of a great burnout that could cripple America's workforce. As quit rates have continued to soar at record levels, 4 million people per month have quit since July 21. Employers are having to run with fewer employers. It's getting harder and harder to take a day off to get things done. 30% of people say they feel like they go to work and just can't get their minimal work done. And all of these things are leaving and leading to burnout. Leading to burnout. If you aren't up on burnout, it's a syndrome resulting from stress that has not been successfully managed. Right? Successfully managing stress. People suffer from burnout. They have feelings of energy depletion, exhaustion. They have increased attachment from their jobs. They have feelings of negativity and cynicism and a general lack of efficiency at work. And the number of people suffering from it has, rosen, has risen Sorry, 38% since 2019. And it's rising. America and Canada lead the world in burnout rates of their employees. Remember what I said about work-life balance? Something people are struggling with today. On top of that, social, family, and work responsibilities often consume our days and leave little time for recovery. The re recovery from stress and the things that overwhelm us, it leaves little time, honestly, friends, for rest. We are struggling as we strive to stay one step ahead of our never-ending list of things to do. All the while, we're kind of withering under the pressure of our career goals, our relationship demands, and all of our other personal obligations. And it's not because it doesn't seem like we have a problem staying busy. Being busy seems to be the easy part. Staying well-rested, that's the hard part. Because our society, friends, has cultivated a mindset of resting after completing work, right? We have cultivated the mindset that I've got to work and then I can rest. And the problem is our work is never done. There will always be more to do on your to-do list. There will always be more that needs your attention. It will, if you only rest when the work is done, you will never feel like you have permission to rest because the work is never done. In his book, The Communicator's Commentary, David L. McKenna described our situation this way. He says, modern society has upset the rhythm of life. Work has been devalued and play has been invaded by the purpose of work. With so much leisure and so many options, play has been subjugated to a time clock schedule with its demand for successful production. In many instances, worship has been eliminated from the rhythm of life and rest has become a dreaded experience on a crash pad. The result is the work is a necessary evil, play is work, worship is idolatry, and the rest is a short course in death. It's good news, isn't it? No. Aren't I just the little ray of sunshine? With all of that in mind... Let me ask you this question. What if we have it backwards? What if we have it backwards? What if we have been focusing on the wrong thing? What if we have proverbially put the cart before the horse? Right? Let me explain. In week one, Marianne Moore started the series by looking at the creation stories in Genesis 1 and 2. If you weren't here, there it is. She took us back all the way to the beginning when God created everything. You know, when God created, uh, went to work and created everything out of nothing in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. In our work week, God worked Monday through Saturday. Then he just took Sunday off, right? And as he looked back over all that he had done and all that he created, he looked over and said, it's good or very good. It had been a good work week for God. 
And maybe this is why we use our patterns to justify our patterns, these patterns in life. But the question becomes, what did humanity do on its first day of existence in the creation narrative? What did humanity do on the first day of existence in all of creation? It seems like they rested. The first day where they were fully alive, they took the day off and did nothing but were connected with God and experienced God's glory and presence. Humanity's first day alive, they did nothing. They didn't work. They didn't get to work. They started from a place of rest. They enjoyed God and God enjoyed them. So what if instead of working to rest, we were created to work from a place of rest? Let me say that again. What if instead of working to rest, we were created to work from a place of rest? What if Sabbath, the idea of Sabbath, is not a retreat from work at all? What if instead it is a starting off point, a jumping off point? Because it seems like rest in scriptures was the foundation of life, not the reward. Rest was a foundation, not a reward. It seems like rest is the place from which we should start and not end, which is backwards from the way that we have it. That means that the idea of Sabbath was more about preparing for your week, not a recovery period. That would mean that rest and Sabbath were intentional and purposeful periods of slowing down to be renewed. Now, I said something earlier that I said I promised you was going to come back around because it matters a lot here when we think about this. When I said God isn't as concerned about what you do as how you do it. This applies to Sabbath as well. This applies not just to work, but also to our rest. Thinking back to the scripture I read at the beginning, and I opened this up with, Jesus says a lot in John 15 about this idea, about the topic of work and rest. He frames work through the lens of bearing fruit, right? Of being fruitful, of producing He frames rest in the language of abiding, right? And he says it a lot in those 12 verses. He tells us a lot about what our priorities ought to be and what the outcomes will be in balancing work and rest. But what he says is most important to us is about the type of rest that we need most, about the type of rest we need most, and that the type of rest we need most It's not necessarily more time at the lake, more time at the beach, more time in the gym, more time in our garden. Maybe some of those or all of those, a little bit, but he says the rest we really need is found in him. He says the rest we need is found in him, that we need to abide in him. Not just time off and more vacation days, but a time off that is rooted like a branch that is connected to the vine, like we are connected to him. He paints an illustration of rest that is grounded in something and focused on something, on Jesus. And in that rest and abiding that we should feel so connected to him that we are dependent upon him for our very source of life and sustenance. That literally we will die if we are disconnected from him. I can't help but picture this like my cell phone, right? It is working all the time. I almost, this is probably next to the time that I'm sleeping. This is probably the only time that I don't have my phone on me Um, in the shower, but I'll let you figure out the rest and, and draw your own conclusions. But my phone is working all the time. I seldom do I turn it off. Seldom do I get away from it. It's working all the time. Even when I'm not on it, it's sending and receiving information. I'm getting text messages and emails and updates on different things that matter to me and all of this kind of stuff. It's working nonstop. It processes just about everything I need it to do. Like I can literally ask what flights are above me right now and it'll tell me. I literally could go and open an app and just literally see the galaxies and the stars through an app. Anything I needed to do. Anything. It rarely gets a break. Rarely do I turn it off. But it regularly needs to stop 
working and to get plugged in. Without it, the battery dies and it becomes useless. It can no longer do what it is intended to do and what I need it to do. That's kind of the, the imagery that Jesus is painting here. That we need to rest, and that type of rest we need is to be plugged into him, right? Because if you don't have the wall charge on a cell phone plugged into the wall, and, and you try to just throw it in a cup, it ain't going to do anything, right? It needs the right kind of charge. It needs to be plugged in. And Jesus goes so far to say that if we aren't regularly resting in him, then we will never bear kingdom fruit. Let that sink in for a moment. If we are not regularly resting in him, that we will never bear kingdom fruit. Now, maybe that's too churchy language for you. Let me say it a different way. Without resting, Jesus tells us that all of our efforts will be fruitless. Doesn't matter what we do. We won't be very effective or productive. We are going to be handicapped. We are going to be limited, limited in our fruitfulness and our productivity. We won't make much of a difference in our circles, and we won't have much influence in the world. We will be useless. And he says that it, like a branch that has fallen from a tree, it gets pitched, thrown into a burn pile, and burned like I did on my deck last night as I sat around roasting s'mores over a fire. It's as useless as a dead cell phone. And it's almost as if Jesus is pointing us, again, towards something. It's almost like Jesus is pointing out that there will be a big crash if we're not, an, if we're not abiding in him. And friends, going back, a crash is what we're seeing. A, fra- a crash is what we're seeing in workplaces all over the world. A crash is what we're seeing in our lives. A crash is what we're heading towards, isn't it? A crash here, a crash there, wreckage on the left, wreckage on the right of us. Our friends bearing their souls to us as they describe one crash or an impending crash after another. A crash and burn in our lives and we're burning out. People are burning out. Friends, the world pressures performance anxieties into our hearts and into our minds and into our souls. The pressure to compete and to gain a sense of self-worth is present and prevalent everywhere. When we succumb to the pressure to, in an unhealthy uh, uh, work rest patterns, we start to experience other forms of escape from the pressure. Rather than rest that recreates us, we medicate with drugs, alcohol, food, or our, whatever our medicine of choice. Or we overcommit to entertainment activities under the illusion that we're taking time off. Ever hear something like, I need to get back to work so I can get rest for my vacation? You ever said that? I need to go back to work just so I can get some rest. You ever heard that? You ever said that? Friends, the same is true of work. Other than feeling accomplished and satisfied with our production, we feel a sense of pressure to perform and strive constantly for ever-increasing recognition. We end up striving for long hours of actual production. We are out of balance, friends, in our work work and rest rhythms of life. What we desperately need is to abide in Jesus. We desperately need times of rest and recreation with Jesus and our families, whatever it is that helps us connect with God. We need to find these times every day. That's where spiritual disciplines help. We need to find these times every week and make these a priority. That's where being in worship and connected in community like we are here today or being a part of a life group where it can help. We need these times every season. We need to expand expand at times of abiding in God every so often, especially every year. We need rhythms that help us connect to God. We need regular patterns of this in our lives. Otherwise, we will accomplish very, very little. We will feel, feel very disconnected from God and wonder where he went. And I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but I want to be used by God to make other people's lives better. I don't know about you, but I want to make our community better. I want to make the world a better place in the name of Jesus. I hope you do too. 
But Jesus says without healthy balance of work and rest, we're never going to bear kingdom fruit. That will only happen, friends. These things will only happen if we get our work and rest patterns in check. It only happens when we rest in Jesus. Amen? We join me in praying. Jesus, as we look to your life, we see at every crucial moment of your ministry, you stop and retreated and rest and prayed and connected to your Father in heaven. Not only did you tell us these things and model for, you modeled for us what is important, you modeled for us a way in which to live. So God, as we look to work and rest, help us to have a healthy balance Help us to to be productive and uh, help us to do good work. But God, most importantly, help us to rest. Help us to start from a place of rest. Help us to see that need. But God, most importantly, help us to realize the rest we need the most. The most important thing we can do is to connect to you, to be plugged into you, to abide in you in whatever way that means for us. So God, the ways in which we abide today, help us to be recharged, re-energized, challenged, encouraged. Help us to know that we are loved. So that as we go into what comes later, we will bear kingdom fruit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today we come on this Pentecost Sunday to bring together two key elements of our faith. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit that created the church and communion, the Last Supper in which Jesus brought all of his friends and disciples together to share a meal. So today as we prepare for this liturgy, as you recite the words, keep in mind we are called to always be open to the power of the Holy Spirit that can come through these gifts of bread and wine. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning of your spirit moved over the face of the waters. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. Your spirit came upon prophets and teachers, anointing them to speak your word. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. At his baptism in the Jordan, your spirit descended upon and declared him to be your beloved son. With your spirit upon him, he turned away from the temptations of sin. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. 
He healed the sick and fed the hungry and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always, baptizing us with the Holy Spirit and with fire, as on the day of Pentecost. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you, for the many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread, and the power of your Holy Spirit, your church, has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood and empowered by the gifts of the Spirit. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, showing forth the fruit of the Spirit until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And now with the confidence as children of God, let us pray the prayer the Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, Today, everyone is welcome at the table. I would invite those who are helping serve to come forward. The ushers will dismiss you uh, to come and receive communion, and then you can return by the side aisles. The table is open.
As you are able, I invite you to stand and join in singing our final hymn, Spirit of the Living God. It's hymn 393. After God created everything and made it good and made it beautiful and man rested, then he put man to work. He said, go forth and be fruitful and multiply. So as you leave this place, as you rest and go to work, as you rest and go and be fruitful, may you go and do good things, do good work. May you advance the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, but may you abide in God. Because apart from him, friends, we can do nothing. So go today as you leave and wherever the Lord may take you, go in grace and peace and go and take a nap. Jesus, God bless. Amen.